This is, uh, not the Spider-Man I remember. But hey, we'll take it. Meet Rick. Wait a minute. Anyway, Rick was late for school one day. His face was red and sweaty as he sprinted after the bus. His heart was pounding in his chest, but he didn't give up. But then, just as he made it, Rick stumbled into the stop sign. And another one. He tried to compose himself, but before long, he found himself smacked by the door. Talk about a lackluster entrance. <laughs> when Rick entered the school bus, he was greeted by a sea of students. But as he walked down the aisle, no one wanted to sit next to him. Not even the ugly chicks. Then, he spotted his friend Trey. While they chatted, Rick looked back at his crush Jill, who was sitting across from them with her Chad boyfriend. Trey told him to cut it out and stop staring at her. He said he couldn't get Jill because he wasn't in the right group. You know how there's nerds, emos, jocks, and uh, mafia members? Unfortunately for Rick, he wasn't in the popular crew. Rick and his class go on a field trip to a science lab that specializes in genetic modification. As they're walking in, he spots Jill talking to a bird. He walks over and makes a fool of himself. Boy got no game. Perhaps he'll have better luck with the other bird. He goes to take a picture of it, but just then, the science guy says no flash photography is allowed. Uh-oh. Rick's flash goes off and the bird spontaneously combusts. Turns out, one side effect of its genetic modifications was sensitivity to light. Jill turns around, but along with everyone else, she doesn't notice. Still though, there's a fire to be put out. Rick does his best, but ends up launching it at Jill's boyfriend, Lance. He tries to pick a fight with Rick, pushing him. Jill comes to his rescue, but Lance isn't ready to give up just yet. He prepares to punch Rick when a hand grabs him from behind. It's the CEO of the science company, or as Lance knows him, Uncle Lou. After calming down his knucklehead nephew, Lou greets the students and coughs into a napkin. There's blood on it. Rick notices and asks if he's okay. Lou says yes. It's the good kind of cough blood. Ah, of course. Rick properly introduces himself and Lou recognizes the name. He knew his parents, his mother in particular. He asks how they are, but Rick reveals they passed away. Aside from that, they're fine. We cut to a look at some so-called super dragonflies. Inquisitive Jill takes a closer look and notes that one is missing. It flies over to Rick, who is, for whatever reason, battling a raccoon. Then, the dragonfly bites him. Look, it ain't a spider, but it'll have to do. Rick stumbles home, and he's looking awful. His uncle reminds him to feed the fish, but Rick vomits in the fish tank. I guess that counts. He makes it to his room, and his uncle follows him. Uncle Albert reads out from a book about puberty and notes that mood swings are common, as are monthly bleeding. Wait, th this isn't the right book. Rick falls back in bed and passes out. Meanwhile, Lou's company is undergoing scrutiny from its board of directors. One man stands in front of a painting of Lou, talking all kinds of smack about him. Suddenly, Lou walks out of the painting and around the corner. The man is left flabbergasted as Lou walks into the room. He assures the board his new invention will save the company and his life. That's right, Lou only has one hour left to live. Here's an hourglass to prove it. Oh, uh, moving on. He gets in the machine and it seems to be working, but then it breaks down. One board member walks up and basks in Lou's demise. At that moment, Lou grabs the man and sucks out his life force. Guess the experiment was a success after all. Lou is now a bona fide supervillain. He breaks free from his restraints and begins attacking everyone else who's there. Back at home, Rick googles his symptoms when he suddenly receives a friend request from Professor X. He tells Rick that he has the answers he needs. Then, he gets up and reminisces about his dad. He just can't believe he's gone. He thought he'd live forever. Later, Rick and his class attend the science fair. And there's a special guest. The inspirational Stephen Hawking arrives and lays down some wisdom on the kids. He breaks down the fact that he's actually extremely depressed and wishes he could walk around and do all the things they can do. Everyone is shook. Meanwhile, Rick stares at Jill as he walks. Time seems to slow down. Uh-oh, he bumps into Lance, who warns him to watch where he's slow-mo walking. That's fair. Rick goes to get a sip of water, but finds his hands have become stuck. Upon closer inspection, he finds that they've become sticky and hairy. Huh, <laughs> so nothing's out of the ordinary. Now, just to get that other hand free. Oh no, he smacked Lance. A slow-mo fight breaks out with Rick expertly dodging Lance's punches. Or not. He gets sent flying into Stephen Hawking's. Oh god, not the bees! A total frenzy has broken out and Rick is not about to stick around. He'd rather run outside and stick to some walls. As he climbs, inspiration strikes and he begins to break it down. Suddenly, he spots an old lady on the road as a broken truck is barreling down towards her. Without thinking, Rick throws himself between the woman and the truck and pushes her out of harm's way. A crowd of onlookers form and applauds his heroic act and congratulates him on being such a good Samaritan. Rick smiles at them, then turns around to look for the woman. And he pushed her and her dog into a wood chipper. <laughs> oh my god. After, Rick goes home and receives a very sharp greeting from his uncle. Fortunately, he catches it. Uncle Albert and Trey are shook, but Rick explains it away. It's easier than it looks, he says. Albert puts the theory to the test, shooting Trey, who reacts significantly slower. 
Well, the cat's out of the bag. Or should I say the dragonfly? <laughs> Rick definitely has superpowers, but just to be extra sure, Albert stabs him. My goodness, good thing that didn't work. Albert and Trey are excited for Rick, but he starts whining about things. He never wanted these powers. Albert reminds him that his parents wanted greatness for him. We cut to the night of their passing. They had just left an opera and were walking down a sketchy alley. What the dog doing? Rick's dad tells him that one day people are going to look to him to be a hero. And when that day comes, he must be ready. However, Rick never expected that day to be now. A robber apprehends his dad and Rick decides to be a hero. He takes action but inadvertently causes the man to shoot his mom and the light post and the other light post. And now his dad's begging him to stop. But Rick can't. He's being a hero. The robber runs away, traumatized. Rick tends to his father who asks him to reach into his jacket and retrieve a ring. As his father recalls the importance of this heirloom, it slips. Wow, oh, okay. Well, he gets it back, and back in the present, he decides he's not worthy of the ring. He tosses it, but it comes right back. Into his eye. Suddenly, he hears screaming, gunfire, and animal noises coming from Jill's house. She comes outside, and they chat for a bit. Oh, and her fence is electric, cause why not? Then, Lance pulls up in his whip, cutting their conversation short. But she does say that Rick could give her a ride sometime. He turns back to look at his car, and well, it's a bicycle, and now it's gone. Jill heads off. Oh look, some birds, and they're, they're gone. Back in his room, Rick receives another message from Professor X, but this time, it's a video. He says he can help him train, but then the video starts bugging out and Rick can't make out what he's saying. Something about deleting his internet history. After the call, he gets a pop-up ad about a car loan. Great, just what he needs. Rick goes to the bank to get that car loan, but gets denied. He says he really needs this, but the teller says, I miss the part where that's my problem. Classic. At that moment, a gunshot goes off. Someone is robbing the bank, and Rick and his aunt make a run for the door. But so does their would-be robber. The man has trouble opening the door. You know, one of those push-pull moments. The ever-polite Rick helps him. He had the same problem coming in. The bank teller runs up and is upset. Rick claps back. I miss the part where that's my problem. Just as he utters those words, two gunshots go off outside. Rick runs outside to find a crowd huddled around someone but that someone was a very talented monkey. Relief washes over him until he spots Uncle Albert collapse on the road. Rick runs over and Albert delivers the famous line. You know, something about responsibility? I don't know, I don't remember. The paramedics arrive and it appears he'll live another day. Meanwhile, Mr. Landers is looking worse for wear. His vital signs are all out of whack. Then, his assistant pulls up. Awesome, just what he needed. He grabs her and zaps her life force. Rejuvenated, Lou enjoys his power before remembering he's gotta deal with the body. He stuffs it in the cabinet, but just then, the janitor walks in. That's a little sussy, he thinks to himself. Back to Rick. After visiting his uncle in the hospital, he runs into Professor Xavier, who, as we know, can read minds. He proves it to Rick by having him think of a number, but then Rick goes ahead and says it out loud. The professor thinks to himself, they don't pay me enough for this. Professor X takes Rick to his school for gifted children. We see lots of wacky mutants along the way, and even some classic ones. We continue our tour around Xavier's school as he switches out his wheelchair for something more comfortable. Wow, okay. The professor tells Rick he has the potential to be the best of them all, but Rick says he can't even fly. Though, apparently once he learns the true nature of heroism, he will. Whatever that means. Then, Rick and Professor X run into the professor's wife. She believes Xavier has been up to no good. She grabs at the air, but really, it's Invisible Girl, who she found in Xavier's room. The wife beats her up, then brings out their children to shame the professor. I can't believe he did this, especially since they just had a new baby. But Xavier thinks it isn't his. The baby uses its telekinetic powers to launch him away. Yep, gotta be his. With Xavier gone, rip in peace, his wife steps in. She reveals to Rick that the key to being a superhero is making a costume. Makes sense. He gets straight to it, doodling away a number of designs. Some good, some bad, and some we just won't talk about. At last, he finishes up, and just as Trey walks in, he's very impressed with the suit, especially how Rick managed to make the fabric breathable and even see-through. Oh wait, he didn't. Now blind and unable to breathe, Rick collapses. By the time night comes around, he's made the necessary adjustments and is about to perch menacingly on a gargoyle. Hey, this is that guy's usual spot. They agree to share, but actually this is kinda weird. Then they get to chatting about their powers. This guy can light himself on fire, but wait, that means he's on fire. The man collapses in pain as Rick gets the fire extinguisher. That's not how you, oh, uh, whatever. Moving on. Rick gets a job at a newspaper place, supplying photos of Dragonfly. Hmm, his boss notes that these pictures are almost like Dragonfly's the one taking them. But Rick proves the contrary. Very nice. Suddenly, someone pops in to report on a police standoff at the university. Rick disappears and both men are left flabbergasted. 
At the university, the supervillain Hourglass makes his first appearance, aka Lou Landers. He's there to steal some ceruleum, which he needs to stay alive. However, Dragonfly is here to save the day. But after a strong punch, he must pause to stare lovingly at Jill, who is also there. He gets back to it with Hourglass and they reach a standstill. The camera spins around as they spit out generic hero and villain one-liners. However, things end up going too fast and they need a break to puke. Understandable. Back to the action, Hourglass whips out some blades that are sharp enough to cut through diamond. But that's okay. Dragonfly isn't wearing any diamonds. As the blades go straight for him, he dodges, but poorly. Hourglass gets away. Some time passes and we find Rick approaching Jill as she exits the theater. She just auditioned for a role in a better movie. He had a secret to tell her, but he couldn't find the courage to say it. He gave her flowers and she said, I feel like you have something to tell me. Rick tried to work up the courage, but he just couldn't reveal his true feelings and that he was Dragonfly. She walked off and then a bunch of goons chased after her. Rick donned his costume and beat the bad guys up. When they were all but defeated, Rick stared lovingly into Jill's eyes while turning this guy's arm into spaghetti. She's in absolute awe of the hero before her, who, uh, continues to bash these guys' heads in. After, we check in with Lou, who with the help of Death Machine Maker, home version, concocts an evil plan. Hold up, get out of here, paperclip guy. After crunching some numbers, Lou learns he only needs to clap just over 47,000 people to achieve immortality. Very cool. Oh look, it's that time of the year, Thanksgiving. Rickson invited Jill over and they talk about relationship stuff while Auntie stops the turkey. My goodness, it sure can feel a lot. Just as Jill is about to proclaim her true love for Dragonfly, her boyfriend Lance comes through and he brought his uncle, Lou. As for Rick, he's late. He stumbles into his room through the window but makes some noise in the process. A suspicious Lou offers to check things out. He makes his way up and Rick has no time to react. He's draining the main vein. Lou enters but Rick is nowhere to be found. Uh oh, he's about to drop some… sweat. As Lou walks off, it drips down. He quickly turns around but eventually figures it was just his imagination. Then it happens again. And again. Before you know it, it's raining indoors. This time, Lou looks up but somehow, Rick is gone. He's hiding. Every time Lou checks the spots he's in, he's gone. Then he ends up behind him. Literally. Even then, Rick cannot be caught. His evasive maneuvers have proven extremely effective. A defeated Lou returns downstairs and Rick follows shortly after. At dinner, Rick and Lou notice each other's scratches and bruises. Lou claims his came from a girl on Craigslist, while Rick says his came from a guy on Craigslist. In that moment, Lou realizes that Rick must be Dragonfly, but Rick remains none the wiser. Lou and Lance head out, leaving Rick and Jill to share a moment together. They talk about Dragonfly and lovey-dovey stuff. And all the meanwhile, Auntie is just really letting loose, with complete and utter disregard for humanity. Fortunately, Hourglass stops by and lets some fresh air in. Rick is shocked that he knows his identity. Then, as villains do, Hourglass reveals his plan to wipe out thousands. Rick attacks, but ends up knocking himself out. With him gone, Hourglass goes after his aunt. At the hospital, we learn that she is rip in peace. However, Rick's uncle just woke up from his coma. It's imperative he doesn't hear any bad news that may shock his mental state. The doctor enters the room and Albert asks about his wife. Oh, she gone, the doctor says. He mistakenly thought that was good news. Understandable. At the funeral, Albert proclaims his love for his late wife and hops into the casket. But wait, there was a mix-up. This is his wife. Oh, on second thought, funerals are too expensive. How about a cremation? Excellent. Then, Jill is totally making moves on Rick, but he rejects her. He must keep her safe. About three hours pass and Rick is very depressed. He even grew a beard. However, Uncle Albert and Trey come to the rescue and give him a prep talk. Albert hands him his father's ring and reminds him to honor the words inscribed on it. Some of the words include honor, dignity, pride, duty, commitment, bravery, affordable healthcare. Okay, that's enough. Rick decides he'll be a hero but doesn't know where to start. Where is he going to find thousands of people all in one place? Suddenly, the TV turns on and there's a convention where thousands of people will be in one place. This must be where Hourglass is going to do his evil plan. Rick heads over and guess who's there? Lou. Rick immediately informs him that the Hourglass must be one of the attendants. Lou thinks it's the Dalai Lama. Apparently, he saw him with some ceruleum. He's the next speaker up, but when the curtains go down, Dragonfly is on the stage beating the poor man senseless. Amidst all the confusion, the real Hourglass makes his move and runs away. Dragonfly makes chase and finds himself in a hero convention. Well, isn't that convenient? Hourglass takes off in his chair of destruction and drops some rubble on Dragonfly. Using his super strength, he launches it up, only for it to fall back down again. Hourglass decides to finish him off with those diamond-piercing blades he loves so much. But Jill comes to the rescue and tanks the damage. Hourglass pieces out and Dragonfly is in shambles. In his moment of weakness, he speaks with Stephen Hawking who quotes some inspirational Celine Dion songs for him. That's just what he needed. Dragonfly rushes to the roof and grabs onto Hourglass. He uses the rejuvenating energy to save Jill. 
She wakes up and wait, that's not. Get out of here, man. Dragonfly turns his attention to Hourglass and there's only 10 seconds left until he reaches immortality. Wait, so doesn't that mean that thousands of people have already died? Haha, <laughs> Any, anyway. Dragonfly moves in, but Hourglass throws an appropriately hourglass-shaped bomb at him. Oh geez, that's one place it can go. He calls out to Jill to yank it off, but she's not that kind of girl. With no time to spare, Dragonfly backflips his way out to Hourglass and blows up all over his face. While victorious, him and Jill are now falling to their deaths. If only he could fly. Then she notices his family ring. It's Rick. And she confesses her love for him. Through the power of boners, Rick sprouts wings and flies back up. Everyone lives happily ever after, except for Stephen Hawking's. And actually, you know what? Rick and Jill don't make it either. Moral of the story? I have no idea.